Well, Mr. President, we are running out of time in Ukraine to use U.S. weapons for the launch of nuclear weapons. The U.S. military could refuse to obey. They will confirm the authentication. You must make a decision, Mr. President. People can advise him, but nobody can stop him. Nuclear war, the communication will go from the President of the United States to the Commanding General of Strategic Command. He will input it, confirm, and then we all die. They're beating the Israelis head to head in a stand-up fight in southern Lebanon. In summary, we are just one poor decision away from catastrophe, whether that decision comes from Joe Biden, approving Ukraine's strikes deep into Russian territory, or the United States giving the green light for Israeli actions targeting Iranian nuclear leadership and oil infrastructure. A bad call by the U.S. to capitalize on perceived Chinese weakness, pushing Taiwan's independence, could also spark military conflict. Any of these scenarios could quickly thrust us down an irreversible path one that leads inevitably to a full-scale nuclear war. There's no such thing as a limited nuclear war. Once nuclear conflict begins, it will spiral out of control, bringing destruction to all of us. The grim truth is, if Joe Biden had approved, for example, allowing Ukraine to use us weapons on Saturday, our Sunday brunch would never have happened we'd all be dead. That's how rapidly this could escalate. Now, I don't want to be accused of fear-mongering, but it's crucial that every American feels the weight of this reality. There are real consequences to our elections, and it's vital that the leaders we empower through our votes adopt policies that protect the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness we all hope to achieve. The President of the United States holds exclusive authority over the launch of nuclear weapons. While the President can receive advice, no one can stop the decision. In an extreme case, the U.S. military could refuse to obey an unconstitutional order, but such a scenario would require the president to act in a profoundly out-of-bounds manner. Under normal circumstances, once the president authorizes a nuclear strike, the military is obligated to carry out the order without delay. The president has unique communication capabilities that bypass the input of advisors like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Secretary of Defense. In the event of a nuclear war, communication flows directly from the President to the Commanding General of Strategic Command, the individual in charge of all U.S. nuclear strategic assets. The order to launch would be transmitted directly from the President to this Commanding General, ensuring immediate execution. Here's how it unfolds. Once the situation escalates, they will open the briefcase, and the President will be handed pre-prepared cheat cards small 3x5 cards outlining various war plan options. At this point, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the National Security Advisor will advise the President, saying, Mr. President, we recommend implementing Plan B for this particular scenario. These options are tailored to meet the specific threat at hand. Ideally, there would be time for the President to carefully consider the situation. But due to the rapid nature of nuclear conflict, particularly with the rise of hypersonic weapons, the once ample window of 12 to 15 minutes for deliberation has now been reduced to less than five minutes. As detailed in Annie Jacobson's exceptional book on nuclear war scenarios, these five minutes are likely to be filled with disbelief on the president's part as they question whether this is really happening. Mr. President, you must open the suitcase. But is this really what we're talking about? The pressure mounts. Mr. President, you must open it now. As the president opens the case, the options unfold. Mr. President, we are running out of time. You must make a decision minus 30 seconds until they cross the line, and we won't be able to respond. The urgency builds. Mr. President, we are running out of time. Issue the order now. The clock is ticking. And even though it may turn out to be a bluff, once the order is given, it's irreversible. The process begins, and everything shifts to full, automatic execution. It's like a playbook, but it's more than that, it's a lifeline. The President opens the communication device authenticates the codes, and issues the order. There is no turning back. The authentication process is critical. The president inputs his unique code, confirming the launch, while the other party on the receiving end verifies it. Once confirmed, the countdown begins, and 72 minutes later the world could be changed forever. Meanwhile, Israel has launched a missile attack on Iran using air-launched ballistic missiles, which differ from the ground-launched ones typically employed by Iran. These missiles are derived from systems like Russia's Kinzhal, an air-launched ballistic missile. Israel has used these missiles in past combat operations, and it's believed they had prepared around 56 of them for this strike. 
A package of 56 missiles is enough to target key sites, though not enough to incapacitate all of Iran's capabilities. It's similar to the package used during the Gulf War when 35 cruise missiles were launched to hit sites like the Taji Missile Production Facility north of Baghdad. This is the kind of operation Israel seems to have executed, launching a significant number of missiles approximately 40 against Iran's targets. Israel has cleared out air defense sites in an effort to neutralize radars, paving the way for approximately 18 of their longer-range missiles to strike a missile production facility near Tehran, known as Parchin. There may have been another facility hit as well. This move was likely designed to send a strong message, with Israel targeting the facilities that produce the very missiles Iran has used to attack them. The success of this mission is debated. Pro-Israeli outlets call it a significant victory, while Iranian sources deem it a total failure. As someone with experience in battle damage assessment during wartime, I would say the truth lies somewhere in between, perhaps leaning slightly toward the Iranian perspective. Contrary to what some may suggest, I don't believe the attack was a failure at all. Israel launched a carefully planned multi-wave assault. To clear a path toward Tehran, they had to first neutralize air defense systems in place. This required a sizable air effort, with over 100 aircraft deployed, including F-35s, F-15Is, and F-16Is. These were the core of Israel's strike package. Despite the significant show of force, none of these aircraft entered Iranian airspace, and the air-launched ballistic missiles were fired over Iraqi territory, north of Baghdad. This wasn't a sustained series of waves, it was a singular, decisive strike. One of the more intriguing questions surrounding this operation is whether Israel had permission to use Jordanian airspace. Historically, Israeli forces have launched strikes over Syrian and Iraqi airspace, including a notable strike on April 19th. However, given the Russian detection systems in Syria, Israel may have chosen to avoid detection by flying at low altitude over Jordanian territory. This would have required approval from the Jordanian government and their air force, a decision that could potentially cause embarrassment for Jordan in the coming days. The strategic objective of Israel's military operation is to secure a larger portion of southern Lebanon with the aim of pushing Hezbollah beyond the range of their rocket bases. The broader goal is to create a stable environment that would allow Israeli settlers to return to northern settlements, from which 60,000 were displaced. Israel had hoped to establish a presence 20 kilometers deep into southern Lebanon, along a front of about 100 kilometers. However, their progress has been limited, having only advanced a few hundred meters in certain areas, and they've yet to seize control of a major town. The military continues to face ambushes as they push forward. Israel's elite forces and armored divisions are taking heavy losses, with Hezbollah continuing to strike hard. The bottom line is, Hezbollah has effectively halted Israel's advance and is now punishing them with ongoing rocket attacks, not only within Lebanon but also targeting Israeli forces inside the country. As Israel scrambles to deploy reserves to replace the battered forces in Lebanon, they're being met with more Hezbollah rocket fire. Instead of successfully resettling 60,000 Israeli settlers, tens of thousands more are now fleeing the area. This situation is turning into a complete disaster for Israel. It appears that Israeli leadership, particularly in the aftermath of their target operations such as the assassination of senior Hezbollah commander Imad Mani, underestimated Hezbollah's resolve. They believed that by eliminating key figures, they could gain the upper hand. But Hezbollah has shown its resilience maintaining a deep, well-organized leadership structure and a battle strategy that is clearly effective. Right now, in southern Lebanon, they are decisively outmaneuvering and overpowering the Israeli forces in direct, head-to-head -head combat. It seems clear that Benjamin Netanyahu is beginning to recognize the situation he's facing. With the current political and military climate, especially with Yov Gallant serving as Minister of Defense, it's become evident that Israel is losing. Gallant and other senior military officials have essentially acknowledged that Israel's current strategies are failing. The plans are not working, and the military leadership has made it clear that victory is not within reach. Netanyahu now faces a critical decision. Either he must accept that Israel needs to change course, or he will have to fire Gallant and replace the senior military leadership something that is virtually unprecedented during a time of crisis. But this is no ordinary crisis. This war is not just about Israel's security, it's about Netanyahu's legacy. He is making decisions that are focused more on preserving his own political future than on the true protection of Israel. In light of this, it's likely that Netanyahu will soon make moves to clean house within the defense sector, perhaps as a final, desperate attempt to hold on to some semblance of political viability.
However, this too is expected to fail, and in the end, Netanyahu may find himself removed from power, as he has become more of a problem than a solution for Israel. This situation underscores the utter disarray within Israeli leadership and government, largely due to Benjamin Netanyahu's approach. When Yoav Gallant talks about a lack of strategy, he's referring to the absence of a coherent military strategy that aligns with what would typically be considered rational national security priorities. However, because Netanyahu is focused on protecting his own political legacy, the strategy he is pursuing is completely different from the one Gallant believes Israel should follow. Gallant is openly calling out the lack of direction, and the consequences are becoming increasingly dire. Israel is losing up to 10 soldiers a day in Lebanon, with many more wounded. These casualties are not sustainable, especially given that they are being incurred in some of the most elite Israeli units. The Edgars, an elite commando force specifically trained to operate in northern Israel and southern Lebanon, are being decimated by Hezbollah. As I've mentioned before, Hezbollah has been preparing for this conflict for 16 years, with every valley, stream, wadi, and hill already turned into a pre-planned ambush site. The result is a devastating and costly toll on Israeli forces. It's hard to say what will happen next. But one thing is certain, Netanyahu bears significant responsibility for the events of October 7th, and he must be held accountable. There are many who believe that he too should be removed from power. Looking ahead, I do believe that within the ranks of the Israeli military, there will be increasing dissatisfaction, especially depending on who replaces Yoab Gallant as Minister of Defense. If Gallant is replaced by a warfighter, someone who truly prioritizes the well-being and interests of the soldiers and advocates for them, the military might accept this change as a mere political dispute and move on. However, if Gallant is replaced by someone more aligned with the extreme right say, a figure who is known for inflammatory rhetoric or political agendas, the military will not tolerate that. In such a case, we could very well see the beginnings of an active revolt within the military, a direct challenge to Netanyahu's leadership. In theory, yes, but in practice, absolutely not. In fact, quite the opposite is true. This isn't just about looking back at incidents like the attack on the USS Liberty, which highlights Israel's reckless disregard for American national security interests. It's not just about Jonathan Pollard, the American citizen who, in the 1980s, stole some of the most sensitive intelligence in the US and handed it over to Israel. This included a comprehensive list of US intelligence frequencies, collection methods, and key intelligence operations data worth billions of dollars. Israel then turned around and sold this vital information to the Soviet Union, America's primary adversary at the time, putting U.S. operations at risk. The reasoning behind this was to help facilitate Jewish immigration, but in doing so, Israel jeopardized U.S. security interests. By giving the Soviets access to critical intelligence, they allowed the Soviets to block U.S. surveillance capabilities, while also enabling them to spy on us. But it doesn't end there. Israel spies on the U.S. more than any other nation. They infiltrate the White House, the Pentagon, and even private industries. Israeli intelligence operates inside the U.S. not to protect us, but to gather information for Israel's benefit, sometimes even at the expense of the United States. The fact is, Israel is not a true ally to the U.S., in today's world, Israel does not contribute positively to American national security. In fact, their actions often undermine our interests. Ask any U.S. ambassador representing the country right now what America's unquestioned support for Israel has done to the U.S. reputation on the international stage. Just look at the BRICS nations and the growing shift towards Russia and China. A major factor in this shift is America's blanket support for Israel and Israel's behavior, which often runs counter to American values. What Israel is doing right now is nothing short of open genocide, mass murder, and widespread destruction. Just recently, they held a funeral for an Israeli soldier, where his brother and fellow soldiers delivered a eulogy that has sparked outrage. They recalled how this soldier volunteered to go into Gaza with the explicit intent of killing every Arab man, woman, and child he encountered in the name of revenge. They even joked about his actions, including blowing up a Palestinian home and shooting a Palestinian farmer, boasting about these actions as if they were something to be proud of. This disturbing mindset reflects the troubling reality of Israel's actions and policies. And this is precisely why the United States is suffering right now. By aligning ourselves so closely with Israel, we are tying ourselves to a cancerous force that is spreading not only across the Middle East, but affecting global perceptions of the U.S. 
This unflinching support is damaging America's reputation and its standing in the world. As long as the United States does not pose a direct threat to Iran's national security, there is no reason for Iran to view the U.S. as an adversary. It's important to note that Iran is a nation focused on preserving its own sovereignty, not projecting power around the world. Unlike the U.S., which operates over 800 military bases across the globe, many of them positioned around Iran, Iran does not maintain such an extensive military presence abroad. If the U.S. refrains from threatening or attacking Iran, then Iran poses no threat in return. In fact, the situation is quite the opposite. From my own direct conversations with Iranian ambassadors, presidents, and senior officials, I can confidently say that Iran would welcome the opportunity to establish normal relations with the United States. They do not see an inherent ideological conflict between the two nations. Iran recognizes the sovereignty of the United States and, in return, simply asks that the U.S. respect and recognize Iran's sovereignty as well. While I may not be an expert on childhood education, I can speak from experience as a father who raised two wonderful daughters, one of whom you met yesterday, and the other at the event in September. When I think back to when they were just two years old, the notion of teaching them anything significant at that age seems absurd. At that stage, they were still absorbing the world around them, but their understanding of complex concepts was virtually non-existent. Sure, you can teach them love, or even expose them to hate, but their ability to truly comprehend these emotions at such a young age is limited, if not impossible. Now, switching gears, what's happening here is just plain stupidity bordering on the extreme and it reeks of racism, especially when coming from someone like Rudy Giuliani. But the real issue is Israel's role. This is a nation that boasts about its influence over the U.S. government, claiming to have bought off members of Congress. Take, for instance, the $100 million spent this year by AIPAC to push its agenda. If you tally up all the pro-Israel lobbying efforts, it likely totals well over a billion dollars. We also have an American Jewish woman pledging $100 million to support Donald Trump's election campaign, all in exchange for his backing of Israel. This is a system where American democracy is being bought and it cannot and should not be allowed to happen. Israel is in the business of buying American democracy, and that raises a key question. Why is this called a friendship? If I have to pay for your friendship, or if I take someone out for dinner and pay for the night, we would call that something else. So, the reality is that America is Israel's subordinate. We are not Israel's friend.